Hello again, Jonathan here in stores with uh, another pair of interesting firearms to show you. Uh, well, I always think they're interesting, but um, these are no exception to that rule. These are both Bang rifles. I know that sound, might sound ridiculous if you're not familiar with the name Bang. Um, that's literally what it's called, Bang Patent. And this is uh, uh, Danish designer Soren Hansen Bang. Genuinely his name, it's not even an unusual name, I'm sure, in uh, Danish. But to us, to our, to our uh, Anglophone ears, it might, might seem funny to call a rifle a bang rifle. That out of the way, <laughs> the reason we have two is that this was a, quite a promising design quite early on in the history of self-loading rifles. Now, the, this, this one at the front here, this chunky looking design with the weirdly Pattern 13, Pattern 1914, Model 1917 style rear sight and protectors. That's not coincidence. This was produced for British trials in 1913. So Bang patented his design, the original design, in 1911. And in 1913, it entered British trials in this form. This is the trial rifle. It's got this great bulbous uh, breech cover at the back which is missing from the one I'm about to show you, so that's one recognition feature. This very uh, 1910s looking rear sight arrangement and the critical mechanical bit lives up here. So the, uh, the Bang rifle, the original patent, was kind of a cup type system. So gases would come off at the muzzle, so the barrel actually stops short inside here and the gases to drive the gun are tapped off in front of the muzzle. Um, so the very first version of the M1 Garand had this, a similar system. It's known as a gas trap. You're trapping the hot expanding gases coming out of the gun in order to then drive the bolt to the rear and a spring brings it forward again. Now it turned out the best way to make a self-loading weapon or an automatic weapon is to drill a hole in the barrel and pipe the gas off and drive the piston that way. That's how the Kalashnikov works. It's how, one way or another, all modern gas-operated systems work. It's just the way to do it. But in the 1910s, we weren't sure about that. Uh, certainly governments weren't sure. They didn't like the idea of drilling holes in the barrel. They thought it would reduce power, reduce accuracy. They thought the gas pressure would wear the hole out until it was too big, which was a some, somewhat valid concern in 1910 when metallurgy is not what it is today. So all of the action, if you like, is happening in front of the muzzle of the barrel that lives inside here. But this isn't really the one we're here to talk about. Now, between the two, so 1913, this is deemed unsuitable, but to be fair, all self-loading rifles were deemed unsuitable that, that were trialled around that time. The sort of elephant in the room here is the Farker Hill. Um, two British designers who worked together on, uh, on an interesting bullpup, uh, which is an area of interest of mine, but they turned their hand to a self-loading rifle as well. And that made it through trials and was actually formally adopted as the Pattern 1918 self-loading rifle in 303. And that's for another day, I think. But unfortunately for them, the war ended that same year, of course, and there was no longer a requirement for a self-loading rifle. It would have been used by um, the RAF anyway. It wasn't meant to be a frontline infantry rifle. We weren't we're a bit, still a bit conservative on the self-loading rifle front, as were most nations, notably except for Mexico, who had adopted a self-loading rifle in 1908. Very forward thinking, but didn't have the production means to fully equip their army. Anyway, I digress. Uh, the rifle we're here to look at in detail is this Bang rifle. This is the Model B1. There's actually a manual you can find for this. It's over on the Forgotten Weapons site. Well worth a read of a period manual for this rifle, I think. Uh, that manual's dated to 1927, and this is sometimes called the Model 1927, but the in-house name um, was the B1. Now, I have to check the Danish on this one, forgive me, and forgive my pronunciation as ever. Uh, the Dansk Rekelrifle Syndikat, which, which in English is Danish Recoil Rifle Syndicate, was the name of the company that made uh, this rifle. And now, slightly easier, version of the name for English speakers was the Madsen Company, or at least that was the original form of the name, actually, I believe. And that's the same company uh, associated with Madsen, the designer, responsible for making the Madsen machine gun. So there's a, a wider firearms world connection 
there. Now, the difference is here, there's still a lot going on at the back. We've, re we've done away with the breech cover. We're just prepared to allow potentially some, some dirt and stuff to go in there, potential weak point. And I'll say right away, the, the disassembly of this, we won't, we won't do that today, there isn't, there isn't time, but the disassembly of this rifle is incredibly straightforward for the time. So 1927, um, with, the, with the nose of a cartridge, you can take the whole gun apart. Uh, we also have to be very careful with this one because it has a split stock. It's been through the trials, not through the wars, but through the trials. Um, so it did suffer a little bit. Um, but just as a hint, for, just as an, as an example, if you press down on here with the nose of a cartridge, rotate this piece and remove it, your whole bolt assembly can come out of the back. Really nice bit of design in terms of uh, maintenance. Possibly a bit too nice for soldiers, uh, for soldiers of the time, because if they get a bit carried away, playing or bored perhaps with, with a cartridge, they're able to completely strip the gun, which um, some people wouldn't enjoy, especially if they lost any bits. Um, quite a distinctive look to this breech cover, and you get an idea here from this, uh, the shape here that there's a cam going on here to rotate the bolt. So rotating bolt. So different arrangement up here. Uh, Bang has moved away, not from the gas trap. We're still trapping the gases after they've come out of the actual crown of the muzzle that's inside here, but he's done away with his weird push forward cup system. To be fair, it wasn't weird in 19, well, it was weird in 1913, but it was a, a valid idea in 1913. By 1927, we've decided that there are problems. In fact, the trials of the 1913 model uh, version here showed that there were fouling issues, serious fouling issues with a cup system, because your cup would fill up with fouling and become, you know, it wouldn't function as well. So rather than a, rather than a cup that, draw, that pulls the mechanism forwards and then you have to convert that into rearward motion, we won't even go into that today, this one is much more straightforward and it's actually a short stroke gas piston. So much like the SVT-40, say, and a lot of modern rifles, it has a rod that is given a, a thwack, <laughs> for want of a better term, and imparts the same, the same thwack at this end to the bolt carrier. The bolt carrier flies back against spring pressure and comes forward again. So it's like a, a rod that floats about in the middle, gets hit up here, and that hit is pushed along to the bolt carrier. It's exactly how um, the FN, FAL works, um, the SA-80, the AR-18, the G-36. They all use a version derived from the, from the Soviet rifles of the, of the 1930s and 40s, not so much from this, but they all use the same basic system. It's just that we're tapping off our gases after they've left the end. Now, all of those gas trap systems give you inevitably a rifle that's extra long because you're adding mechanical stuff to the end of the gun so that it can function. If you use a gas port in the barrel, you immediately cut what, two inches or more off the end of your gun. And that's what ultimately happened. Not with this. Um, so, uh, other features of this, it's quite an interesting design. This is our cocking piece mounted on the back of the bolt carrier. It's, it's um, knurled so that you can manually decock it if you need to, or even manually recock it if your cartridge doesn't fire. So much like a Lee Enfield or something in that respect. So what do we have on the right hand side? We've got a, our cocking handle, obviously, conveniently located on the right hand side. We have this paddle thing here, which strikes me as a bit prone to get caught on all manner of things, but then soak in the cocking handle. We pull back the action, and if we're pressing down on this paddle, magically the bolt stays open. So we have a whole manual hold open device, quite important. Now with a bolt action, you just pull the action to the rear and it stays there. With a spring-loaded self-loading mechanism, you've got to manually stick a bit of metal up in front of the bolt to stop it going forward, because otherwise you can't get your cartridges in. And speaking of getting cartridges in, there's a charger guide here for a charger clip, or a stripper clip if you prefer. Five round stripper clip, seven round magazine. Um, might sound weird, but the Lee Enfield wasn't much different by having a 10 round magazine also fed by five round clips. Admittedly, that maths works. <laughs> Two times five is ten. Um, that doesn't go into this. So you would always be running this as a five round rifle unless you then manually topped it off with the extra rounds. And then to release the system, you 
push up on the paddle. And you'll see that the cocking piece has been left in the cocked position because we've cocked the rifle. It would have loaded around into the chamber and it would have left the cocking piece to the rear, much like a, a bolt action or another self-loading design that you care to mention. Now, flipping over the rifle, there is one more control we need to cover. And this is actually a bolt lock. Now, what's a bolt lock, you might ask? Um, you may very well ask that. It's a lock that locks the bolt. <laughs> now, the reason you won't know what one is necessarily is that this is a weird kind of precautionary safety measure that's only on early rifles. And not just early self-loading rifles, but um, the Thornycroft series of rifles that I, I wrote a chapter about in my book, that I'm very aware that I keep plugging, um, had the same idea. So rather than a safety catch that stops the or blocks the trigger or blocks the sear, or sometimes as well as, there would sometimes be a bolt lock so that disables the bolt. So the gun is absolutely safe for marching, for carrying, for laying up, for piling, um, and no one can accidentally chamber around and put the gun in an unsafe condition. That's what that's for. Doesn't stop you firing the gun, I just have, uh, but it blocks the bolt. So if you've already chambered around, if you've breached your, your normal uh, drills, then this isn't gonna save you. It's not a safety catch per se, it just locks the bolt. Uh, now, my, my colleague, Christian, thank you to, to you, Christian, for digging out this information, has actually found specific information about this rifle, and we love it when we find specifics, not just about a type of weapon, but the very example we have in the collection. It, it's you know, gold, nuggets of gold for us. And um, what he found was uh, some details of the supply of this rifle. Now, originally, the bang was in 7mm caliber, and the 1913 trials rifle was in 276, which is the same thing. Um, the experimental 276 Enfield high velocity cartridge, because that, that was also being looked at at the time. By this point, we have reverted. We've given up on fancy new rimless high velocity cartridges and we've reverted to 303. So what they did was commission specifically to the Madsen company for one example, this example in 303. At quite short notice, um, quite an engineering challenge to suddenly redesign your gun for a rimmed cartridge, but they did it. So from the archive, we know that the order for this rifle was placed on the 21st of June, 1930 and it arrived on the 22nd of December 1930. So it took them six months to reverse engineer their own gun for that 303 cartridge. So it delivered in December 1930, but the rifle wasn't quite right. The, the, the cartridges weren't seating correctly in the chamber, is, is how they describe it. So it went back to the Madsen Company again, and they reworked it and it wasn't received for quite some time, 17th of November, 1931. So there must have been some serious issues with the conversion to 303. So quite a, quite a protracted period, um, but it was a big ask to ask a company who'd already chambered the thing for a perfectly serviceable cartridge to rechamber it for, frankly, an already out of date rimmed cartridge that was a bit less powerful. Um, 303 is amazing, but um, wasn't the best thing on the block even by 1930. So this is 1932 that these trials are going on, the Pedersen and the ZH-29 and the Bang. And unfortunately it was the Bang that kind of fell at maybe not the first hurdle, but quite early on. And we have some good quotes here that I'll read for you. Um, so we had mixed results on accuracy, the first thing to say. So sometimes it was acceptable accuracy, sometimes it was found to be inaccurate. Um, and on handling, they said it was clumsy, ill-balanced, and altogether unpleasant to handle, which is not a ringing endorsement, I'm sure you'll agree. On reliability, the trials report said, uh, has given an immense amount of trouble in connection with feed and ejection. Now that kind of is in keeping with that, those issues they clearly had in converting this thing to 303. We don't know though, to be fair, how many of those issues might have been inherent to the B1. We don't have a great deal of data from other nations on how good the gun was, but there certainly seems to have been an issue with 303. We also had parts breakages. This is not uncommon with early self-loading rifles. They're subjected to such a beating and the metallurgy of the day wasn't as good as it is today. Parts would break. 
Um, think of the Vickers gun, and the only reason they could run those basically continuously was a team of six guys and a big chest full of spare parts. So if a part breaks, you stop the gun temporarily, swap it out, and then get it back running again. Uh, you can't really do that as an individual soldier with your own rifle. So parts breakages are a concern, and they did happen with this. So proved unsatisfactory on that ground. So this thing went through three ejectors. So yeah, maybe quality control wasn't the best either. That's harder to say. So this came out uh, behind the Pedersen and the ZH-29. Those two rifles were kind of level pegging. They didn't pick one over, over, the, above, uh, over the other at that point. Uh, but the bang, sadly, came dead last and was dropped. One other aspect of early self-loaders is there's always a bit, an ability to turn the gas off. Um, so for conservative militaries that maybe want to run them as straight pull, bolt action, and then switch them to self-loading if there's a need to, a bit like a magazine cutoff idea, or if the soldier is trusted in the field to use this to fire one pull per trigger, uh, sorry, fire one shot per trigger pull, then you might have the ability to switch off the gas system in case the gun breaks or starts to malfunction or is full of mud, you might be able to clear it enough, switch off the mechanism and just run it as a straight pull. So that feature is incorporated and the manual does say, the rifle may be used as an ordinary repeater simply by removing the muzzle extension. <laughs> so not the best solution. So the Mondragon, for example, the Mexican Mondragon had a lever, flip up, turn, flip down, the gas is off. Um, it's like the old, did you remember to turn the gas off thing? Um, on this gun, it's kind of an afterthought of, oh, uh, well, you can take the end of the gun off and that'll stop it from working as a self-loading rifle. Maybe a bit of an afterthought. But I don't want to be too critical. Um, Bang was pretty influential in this relatively early stage of self-loading rifles. It's just that um, John C. Garand came along in, uh, well, before 1936, but that's when the rifle was adopted, and created an absolute world beater of a self-loading rifle. And the Soviet Union had already produced the AVS-36 um, by 1936, the beginning of that story. So this guy becomes a bit of a footnote, but it's quite an important footnote, I think. Thanks for watching, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please do check out the description for ways in which you can help us here at the Royal Armouries. We have a donation scheme, we have a membership scheme as well. Um, most of all though, just keep watching. We'll have another one of these next week. You might also like to check out our social media, uh, Facebook and Instagram in particular, because this series of videos actually works with that. If you want to go over there and guess what it is that we're gonna be talking about um, a bit later on, you can do that. So. Feel free to watch these standalone, but there is more, more fun to be had if you join in on our social media. That's all for me, guys. We'll see you again next time.